deeds. I want you to turn in your Bible with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 25. It says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in the hope that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is sin is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. You know, as I read these words, I'm struck by how relevant words written a couple of thousand years ago are to us who live in our time today. Paul says that the entire world is groaning. It's waiting in frustration. The world is in pain. You know, anyone who's honest will be able to tell you that the world is not what it's supposed to be. People know things are not working as they should. As human beings, we know that the world is just not the happy place it's meant to be. And something in us tells us it's not working as it should. You travel across the world, and I'll tell you, people know, in every culture, people know that something is not right. Something is not working. Something should be changed. You know, it's wrong. <laughs> There's just something wrong. <laughs> Talk about people who, by the way, it's interesting, you talk to a divorced person or somebody who's going through divorce in Kenya. Talk to a person going through divorce in Japan. Talk to somebody who's going through divorce in Australia. Pain is pain. And people just know this is wrong. There's no culture where people celebrate that, oh my goodness, I'm going. It's painful. Breakup is painful. We know something is not right in this world. And so back to our question, who will come and save our world? Where is the hope? You know, the easiest answer to this question is government. That the government is a hope. That the government has the solutions to the problems of the world. And you know, the interesting thing is suddenly, I have to say, when governments do their jobs well, that they have capacity to solve many problems that are faced by their citizens. We've seen many examples of this. We've seen examples in Singapore. We've seen examples just next door in Rwanda. That when a government is focused, and when they put their citizens' uh, needs first, that something actually happens, and that standards of living go up, and people are delivered from little problems that were thought of as inevitable before that. So governments do have an important role. I even have to say, by the way, even in Kenya, as much as we're, we, 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 we may have negative things to say about the government, there are some things that our governments have done over the years that have actually been positive for our country. And maybe I need to say it because I think we need to give credit where it's due. I know you're looking at me like, what's this strange guy talking about? But it's the truth. I mean, yesterday I was driving on the Southern Bypass uh, coming here. And it's, in, it's astounding to me how just in the last five, six, seven years, the network of roads in this country, the ability to travel has changed. Uh, I, I was trying to drive to, I was driving towards Naivasha. I mean, if anybody been that road recently in the last like couple of weeks, if you haven't, you'll get lost because the infrastructure development is just astounding. The changes that are happening are astounding. Uh, anybody going to Mombasa on the SGR? Yeah, yeah, we complain. Yeah, we know it's not, it's not Ethiopia's train and there's a better one in New York. I know that. But the reality is you get on that thing and you find yourself in Mombasa and you're shocked. It's like, wow, it's, it's actually dramatic. The shifts, the ability to communicate, the ability to travel. Back in the day, our ancestors would have taken weeks on a journey like that. And today it's interesting, the things that we've seen, the changes we've seen are dramatic even in the last few years in infrastructure. Let's talk about poverty. The, 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 the percentage of people living in absolute poverty in our nation has actually fallen in the last few years. Since 2011, 
Right now, they say it's about 35%. That's pretty high still, I think. And something must be done. But you realize that by 2011, it was over 50% of people who are living in, in serious poverty. And so again, there's been a shift. There's been a change. Something is happening. That's just in the last, uh, how many years? That's less than 10 years, in the last decade that there's been that shift. Let's talk about literacy. And the literacy rate, that's changed as well. It's interesting that be between 2005 to 2015, there were dramatic shifts in our literacy rate. 11% growth in that short time. So today you can say 84% of Kenyans who are, above the year of 20, who are above 24 years actually can read and write. I mean, that's dramatic. That's incredible. Uh, we have one of the highest literacy rates in the region. And that's happened just in the last few years ago. In fact, if you thought that was impressive, since 2015, which is only four years, they say that today, 60% of adults above 24 have finished primary school education, 60%. Again, you might think that's not very impressive until you realize just 2015, it was 44%. So again, there's a shift. Something is happening. In 2019, three quarters of our population is connected to electricity. 75% of Kenyans connected to electricity. Again, you might say, well, that, you know, as Kenyans, we say, what about the other 25? That's our first instinct. But just think about it, that 10 years ago, that number was 30%. Only a third of Kenyans 10 years ago had electricity. In 10 years, we have 75%. You know, the problem is, the, the minute the pastor starts talking about this, the, the, the congregation starts thinking, this guy has been paid by the government. You know, it's so interesting because we are so used to criticizing that we don't even want to see anything good that is happening. But the reality is there have been shifts. There have been changes. There are good things that have happened in our nation. You know, it's interesting because we talk about corruption. And by the way, I agree, corruption is a menace. It needs to be nipped. People need to fight. We need to stand up. We need to do something about corruption in this country. But I do want to say, for those of you who are old enough, you might actually realize the fact that it's actually a lot harder to be corrupt in Kenya today than it was, what, 15 years ago. It's, it's interesting. Today, you have, to be a, you have to be quite smart to be corrupt in Kenya. You, you wouldn't believe it from reading media reports. But there's a time when you, any, any, anybody who was associated to people in power could be corrupt without any consequence back in the day. And I think one of the reasons why we're so, so caught up with corruption is because there's a lot more reporting going about it. The amounts that were stolen, I mean, there was amounts stolen in the past that were astounding that nobody even ever recorded. So again, even there, there's been some growth. There's been some changes, even in government offices. I go to government offices today, and there are many of them. And by the way, I'm a victim of frustration in government offices. So I'm not saying this because the government has paid me. But I go to government offices today and I actually get service that would have been unimaginable several years ago. There's been shifts. So why is it that Kenyans are much more unhappy today than they were 10 years ago? So much for all of us who are saying the day we just have development. The day this country just gets wealthy, something will shift. The thing I've come to understand is, my goodness, even with development, even with the things shifting that government does, it doesn't change our state as human beings. Why? I'll tell you why. Because governments are limited in what they can do. Governments, you know, it's interesting because I would have thought being, being in New Zealand would just be the happiest people alive. Um, and to my sh shock on me, they actually say, by the way, they actually say, here's a very interesting fact. They actually say the index of happiness has not, it's not correlated to the index of wealth. That there are very wealthy countries that are the saddest and unhappiest countries in the world. So they have everything they need, but you don't even want to live there. Uh, I won't even mention countries I've been to where I thought, God, take me back home. Uh, there are countries in the world where they've got all the wealth, but you talk to some, you look at someone, they just look at you and you're like, God, take me back to Kenya. Because man, people there at least smile at you. You know, and they don't. So it's, it's interesting. It doesn't shift. Why? Because there's a role for government, but it's a wrong role. It's a role, that, it's a role that we don't even think it is. The role of government is to provide safety nets, to look after the very poor, to look after poor, to make people, to make sure that nobody's left behind. The role of government is to remove bottlenecks, to ensure that people are able to step up and to use industry to pull themselves forward. That's the job of government. The job of government is to provide hardware. 
They create infrastructure to create medical uh, uh, systems to make sure our health care is looked after. That's the job of government. But there's some things that governments can't do. So here's a good thought. With all those roads, you would think Kenyans get to work much faster today. What's the problem with Kenyan roads? It's not the Chinese, by the way. It's not more cars. It's Kenyan driving. Come on, somebody. How many of you have ever been in a traffic jam for like two hours, and when you pass the place where the jam was, you find there was nothing? Like five lanes were formed. By the way, I believe that corruption is the most basic, I mean, <laughs> overlapping is the most basic form of corruption. Because what is overlapping? It's saying, my time is more important than yours. I have a more faster car. I can actually take a shortcut. I'll get there and look after myself, and the rest of you will look after yourself later. Isn't that what our MPs are doing right now? So who are we to condemn them? Okay, maybe I should do an altar call right now because I can sense a heaviness in the house. I mean, that's what it is. It doesn't matter how many highways we build because the government builds highways and, infrast and, and, and hardware. If the software of the people is not changed, the country will not change. People will not change. The government's job is to provide hardware, but their job is not to provide software. What Kenya is facing is a software problem. Paul says... The creation was subjected to frustration. Not from its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. He's saying, Here's, let me tell you what the real problem in Kenya is. It's not, it's not what you think it is. I'll tell you what the real problem is. He's saying, Genesis 3. He's actually referring back to Genesis 3. When the first human beings rebelled against God. When they decided, we're going to take our own way. Yes, God, I know you want us to do this. We're doing this instead. And they rebelled against God. They carried out a rebellion. And the whole creation was put under a curse by its creator. And the things that were meant to bring us joy now cannot bring us joy. The things that were supposed to give us fulfillment now are, have actually become a source of frustration for us as God's people. And all the problems we've talked about right now in this room, from grand corruption to overlapping, from lack of medical care to, to violence, gender violence, from, des from, from lack of care for the environment to depression and suicide. All these are actually a factor of human sin and rebellion. That's what causes our problem. You know, it's interesting. I was talking to uh, one of my friends. He comes to this church. He's called uh, Maderi, Josek. And I don't know which service. Maybe he was in the first one. But he wrote an article on Facebook a couple of days ago, and I was really intrigued by it. Because he says, cancer is on the increase in Kenya. And he says, I need to tell you that the increase of cancer in Kenya is actually directly related to corruption in this country. And he said, do you know that, by the way? Because he says, yes, you can inherit a predisposition to cancer. But there are triggers that you have to put in your body to activate that predisposition to become full-blown cancer. Otherwise, if you don't get those triggers, you can actually live a whole, a helpful, uh, happy life. And he says, what are the triggers? It's the vegetables you're eating. He says, do you know that the vegetables you're eating in many of our markets have actually been grown using sewer water, using water that has been polluted by industries, and it's being done all over. So here you are, <laughs> eating spinach to live long. You know, you're eating that nice salad. You know, even de depriving yourself of sijui water and what such, you can look nice. Do you, know, do you understand? You're just eating somebody's sewer water. And that is just corruption, isn't it? Because that person knows what they're doing is wrong. But they're doing it because it's a shortcut for them to get ahead. It's human sin that is causing cancer to increase in this country. He says, even the, the recently we are talking about maize that was imported from somewhere that had aflatoxins in it. Cancer causing. Recently we are talking about fruits that are being ripened using chemicals. Cancer causing chemicals. You go to that supermarket, you see that banana looking so sweet and amazing. And you don't understand that it's just poison you're putting into your body. Let's not even talk about meat. Uh, how many people are depressed by that? Some of us like meat too much, man. I was in mourning when I had the newspapers. And he says, this is the reason for cancer. So he says, the problems of Kenya, the problems of Kenya is human sin. It's a software problem. It's not a hardware problem. And you know, that's why Jesus came. And this is an amazing thing. Jesus came to solve the software problem. 
tell your neighbor, Jesus came to solve software problems. You can have the best computer, you can have the most amazing machine, but if your software is faulty, you'll never get anything done. Jesus came for the software problem. John, 1 John 3, 8 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Ah, Jesus knew, God knew that what the devil had done in bringing division between God and human beings was going to cause them all kinds of problems and there's nothing that humans could do to bring themselves back to where they were originally created from. And Jesus knew the only way to do it was to come and actually physically himself destroy the devil's work. Jesus didn't just come to save us from sin, which is a spiritual thing. He didn't just come to come to save us and our souls and take us to heaven. That's not the only reason he came for. Jesus came to reconcile creation back to its creator. He came to end the problems of this earth that is enslaved to sin and to the consequences of sin. And Paul says, when you understand who Jesus is, even though you have the Holy Spirit in you, you're groaning. He tells us, even we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we're groaning. That even as Christians, we're waiting. We know things aren't right. We know that things one day will be right. And there's a groaning in us when we're really honest with ourselves. That a time will come when there'll be no more pain. We long for that time. Because you know that when Jesus comes, there'll be no more pain. There'll be no more cancer. There'll be no more corruption. By the way, you know, we need to teach this a little more. <laughs> Any of you remember the little song that you say, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. And then it would say, no more dying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We are going to see the king. You know, there are times as a pastor, I come to pray for somebody who's bereaved. And I can't tell them anything that will make them feel better. There's nothing I can tell you. There's no prayer I can pray that will console you for losing your husband, for losing your child. And the only consolation I can give you is a time is coming when there will be no more death. A time is coming when there will be no more tears. A time is coming when we'll be delivered from the sicknesses of this body. A time is coming. It's coming. And that's our hope as Christians. We live with a hope that a time is coming when things will be different. But even in the middle of that hope, Paul says there's more. That there's a way that these people who are groaning are anticipating. They're anticipating Jesus coming back. But even as they wait for it, we have authority. We have authority to represent Jesus. We have authority to walk out into the world and to make a difference. We have an authority to alleviate the consequences of sin. As we are being saved, we too can bring that salvation to the world because you understand this about salvation salvation has a now and not yet do you understand that about salvation right now you're saved for those of you who've accepted jesus as your savior you're saved it means that you already are reconciled with god but when you're honest you know that you don't have everything yet there's something that is yet to come so you have the fullness of salvation right now but there's a time that is coming when you'll actually experience completion of that fullness and paul is saying as we have received it in our bodies, we too can do the same for the earth. We'll never be able to alleviate poverty. Not that I can tell you, it will never happen. Jesus says the poor you'll always have with you. But in the same way I've been saved now and not yet, I can bring about solutions now that can alleviate poverty for my generation. There's a difference. You know, there are, there are cultures in this world that believe in something called karma. Karma is that thing that says you're born without problem, you'll always have it. Actually, you can't do anything about it. Just stay in it. By the way, many of the religions of the world, they teach about karma. There's something you did right in the last life, and now you're stuck where you are. You cannot move from there. And so if you're born poor, just be a nice person right now, because hopefully in the next life, you have a chance of alleviating your problems. Christian missionaries across the world said, no. Our God says, we have the power to alleviate poverty now. We have the power to bring about healing now. Do you understand the first hospitals were begun by people who understood who Jesus was? And the reason was because they thought, these people are not going to be sick for life. Somebody can bring solutions. These children are not... The first universities were established by Christians. Why? Because before that, they believed if you're rich, you go to school. If you're poor, you become a work hand. And Christians are the ones who believe, no, you're not trapped by poverty. You can make a difference. And we can lift you out of that poverty in this life. Why? Because we believe the salvation we've received, we can bring to the world as well. 
So this is a powerful thing about the gospel. As God's children, we must be the hope of our world. So I ask you again, where is the hope? We are the hope. We as God's children are the hope that God has allowed us to become a hope to this world. I want to show you a little video of somebody from Avuno Church that I'm really proud of. A member of this church, a member of this campus. Just check this out. I hope you have the video ready. Hi, my name is Esther Kamara, founder of Star Kids Initiative. Star Kids Initiative seeks to provide equal opportunities to children who come from informal backgrounds. And this is as a result of seeing a problem in society. The problem was that um, kids were not simply getting access to the same things. I noticed this when I was teaching Sunday school at Mavuno. The kids from the informal settlement who used to come to class and as a teacher, I felt the need to teach or to spread the love of God to all these children. But the problem was the children from the underprivileged background were not able to either understand or focus on the teachings that I sought to teach. And this was a problem for me and it broke my heart. So I sought to go out there into the informal settlements and empower them. Now, two years ago, I met a young boy called Wonderful. And Wonderful was living in extreme poverty. He used to take care of his bedridden mother who was suffering from stage 4 cancer. And in the morning he used to wake up very early to make sure he takes care of her before he goes to school. And when he went to school at lunchtime he used to make sure he saves half of it so that he can go back home and give it to his mother. This is the state in which we met him and it was honestly very heartbreaking. Um, I sought to solve this problem by ensuring that Wonderful had what he needed to be able to attend school. So it was a pencil here, a book here, a backpack here, some food here, and so on and so forth. Fortunately, Wonderful was able to complete his primary school education successfully and even got called to join a public secondary school here in Nairobi. This was amazing. But then it presented another problem that he didn't have school fees to attend this school. And so again, I went back to think, ah, how can we help Wonderful? How can we help this young boy called Wonderful? And the solution was to raise funds to make sure that he goes to school. And so I called a friend here, a friend there, and asked them, you know, are you able to, to put away some funds to make sure this child goes to school? Truly, the faithfulness of God is, is really there because he did go on Monday. We were able to raise the funds and he reported to school on Monday. Now, uh, Wonderful is home for after two terms of secondary education that StarKids is fully supporting. And this has pushed us to grow or to create a scholarship fund where we have now, we're now reaching out to four other children. So we have five children under the StarKids Initiative Scholarship Fund uh, to make sure that these kids have an opportunity to attend secondary school without a worry of where the fund is coming. I encourage all of you to find your little ways to spread the love to people in our society. It could be a child, an elderly person, a sickly person, but I invite all of you to take the initiative to be the love of God to people in our society. I'm so proud of Esther, because she realized she's a hope. She's a hope. She's, she's, she's one of our children, teaching our, our te children's teachers, a uh, young lady just teaching in Sunday school, not even done with her education. And now she's educating people's children. She's not married yet. She's uh, still finishing her education. But now she's starting an initiative that is changing people's lives. Where's the hope? We are the hope. Imagine that. I mean, that is so exciting for me. I'm so proud of people like Esther and I know there are others in this congregation who are stepping out in this way.